Hey there. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the universe. And this is mostly about stars. And then we have a little bit about the evolution of the universe, including the Big Bang, dark matter, and dark energy. Um, so let's just start with stars. They are uh, point sources of light, and they generate their own light from nuclear reactions, typically nuclear fusion reactions. Uh, they twinkle. Uh, the reason why they twinkle is due to atmospheric turbulence. Um, so in outer space, they just appear as points of light. There is no twinkling. Um, but when we see the light through the atmosphere, uh, there is uh, that twinkling because of the, the atmospheric turbulence. The distance uh, to the star is measured in light years, and a single light year is 9.5 times 10 to the 12 kilometers, which is a long way. Um, and so uh, you remember uh, one meter is three feet, uh, and a kilometer is a thousand meters. So that's 3,000 feet. And this is 9.5 times 10 to the 12 kilometers. Okay, so remember our planets do not generate their own light. Uh, planets are visible by reflected light. Um, in the night sky, uh, star stars near the North Star move through the sky in, in a counterclockwise fashion. So they move this way. Um, it takes about 24 hours for those same stars to reach the same position. On the right, it shows the position uh, of the Big Dipper. So we can see it, you know, here it is around, um, it looks like that's a bit before 6. This is 6 p.m. here. And as the, um, as the Earth orbits, you know, uh, you know, it, it's orbiting and well as is spinning, right? Um, the stars appear to move, but again, that's the Earth moving. The stars are, are not moving, um, and so the Earth is is spinning on its axis, and uh, and so they appear to move through the night sky. So constellations can be used uh, to help you keep track of time. Again, constellations are a group of stars uh, with names that are ancient. Uh, one familiar constellation is Ursa Major. It's a, a, no, called a, that because it's a bear. Okay. Uh, the seven different stars of the Big Dipper are actually very different distances from the Earth. Uh, one is 93 light years. The other one is... 69 light years, another one is 360, another is 53, another one is 116 light years. Again, one single light year, one single light year, I'm going to scroll back, is 9.5 times 10 to the 12 kilometers. Okay, yeah, so the monthly constellations and night sky change as the Earth moves its path around the sun. Um, and as well as, you know, again, we talked about it spinning uh, on its, you know, uh, on its axis. So how do stars form? According to the nebular theory, the sun and planets form together from clouds of gas and dust, which clouds of gas and dust are, the fancy name is a nebula. And the solar system began to condense about 5 billion, 5 billion years ago. Okay, and now we can take a look at a nebula here. Um, stars are forming. Um, and then again, nebulas are concentrations of gas and dust. They are in outer space. And they are, are basically breeding grounds for stars. As, as they condense, um, they form stars and planets. Um, so we can see the Orion Nebula from the Northern Hemisphere, and in the Southern Hemisphere, the Carina Nebula is present. So let's talk about the nebular theory formation. So we talked about gravity last semester in fall, and we have gravitation between materials uh, 
in the this nebular cloud and is and then the cloud pulls inward on itself um, remember these materials are attracted to each other and the cloud is is spinning and the cloud uh eventually conforms to the shape of a spinning disc uh and and as the disc spins the gravitational attraction is accelerated by the atoms moving towards the center they gain kinetic energy and the interior temperature of this nebula is increased. So the temperature goes up and eventually nuclear fusion reactions start occurring. Remember that's different than, than fission. Fission is, you know, we have these radioactive isotopes and that's undergoes nuclear fission where things break down. Nuclear fusion reactions is where things get heavier. Um, during the nebular theory, uh, or during the nebular formation of these, of these stars and planets, um, it takes millions, millions of years. So in the center of a disk is called a protostar and away from the disk, um, a little farther away from the disk out in this direction are, uh, planet, uh, planet tesmals. Um, and they form and they accrete more matter. Um, that means they gain more matter and eventually they become planets. So let's talk about our sun because we're a little familiar with it. Okay, we, we're going to break it down into three different areas. The core, that's right in the middle, um, and that's the hot and that's the most dense region. Um, so we have, again, nuclear fusion reactions. It's going to release energy. Uh, in the form of gamma and X-ray radiation. In the radiation zone, um, that's just out here. This is the radiation zone here. This is less dense than the core. It is probably about as dense as liquid water. Radiation slowly diffuses outwards. It can take millions of years before the photons actually release from that middle radiation zone. Then on the outer part of the sun, we have a convection zone. Um, and it's low density. It's only 1% as dense as water. Um, it's the outermost part of the sun. And this is the convection zone here. Um, and um, this plasma emits energy as visible UV and infrared radiation. Um, and then the surface temperature is pretty, pretty dang hot. 530 Kelvin. You remember zero degrees Kelvin, um, you know, it, or say uh, zero degrees Celsius. Let's, let's start over. Zero degrees Celsius is 273 degrees Kelvin. So you can imagine that 5,800 degrees Kelvin is, is pretty hot. Um, because 273 degrees Kelvin is, is what we think of as, as zero degrees Celsius. Okay, uh, the lifetime of sunlight stars. It converts about 1.4 times 10 to the 17 kilograms of matter to energy each year. That is incredible. 1.4 times 10 to the 17 kilograms of matter to energy. Um, again, this, we believe that the uh, stars, like the sun, formed about 500 billion, or sorry, 5 billion years ago, and it has enough hydrogen, at least our, our sun does, our sun has enough hydrogen for another 5 billion years. Another 5 billion years. The lifetime of the star depends on its mass. Less massive stars have longer lifetimes. More massive stars have shorter lifetimes as they're hotter and they use up their hydrogen to more rapidly. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the brightness of stars. The differences in stellar brightness is the amount of light produced by a star. It depends on the size of the star and the distance to the star. 
So we have this uh, scale called apparent magnitude. It's on the right. It's a diagram on the right. And it quantifies observed brightness. Again, it can be used with the, you know, just with your with your eyes. You don't need any special telescopes or magnifying glass. Not that you would use a magnifying glass, um, but you wouldn't you wouldn't use it. You know, you can use this with your naked eye. You could also use it with a telescope, but this is this is apparent magnitude. Okay, so brightness values range from one, which is the brightest to six, which is the faintest. Some stars are found to be brighter than one, like Sirius is negative 0.42. Uh, Sirius, negative 1.42. That's right, right, right here. That's right here. And then, of course, um, the full moon is very bright. And Venus is bright, so that looks like it's closer to... I don't know, negative four, looks like. Um, that's the full moon in our solar system, and that's the sun in our solar system. Absolute magnitude is a more precise method uh, for determining how bright a star really is. Um, because the problems with, with this scale before that I showed you here, that's called the apparent magnitude. Um, a star at further distance appears fainter than ones that are, are closer. Um, and that's just, um, you know, that, that, that is a problem. So absolute magnitude is a more precise method. Um, so we start looking at, with absolute magnitude, we start looking at uh, star temperature and colors. And a color indicates the star's temperature. A red star is going to be cooler than a blue star. So blue like a blue flame is very hot. A blue star is almost twice as hot as a red star, and it has almost twice the frequency of the red light. So remember, frequency is proportional to temperature. Uh, this is showing a diagram, and this this is this is more than what I'm going to be testing you guys on. I just want to give you a little bit of extra information, you know. Uh, for your interest here. So we have some color vary. This is star temperature and color variations, red, yellow, and bluish white. And again, the color is related to the surface temperature. So red is our cooler stars, blue are hotter stars, and yellow is in between. And that's our, that's our star. This diagram is showing major stellar spectral types and temperatures. O type star is going to be blue. It's this is the temperature, um, and there are some comments that these stars are short-lived and, and pretty rare stars, and they're typically ionized with helium and hydrogen. Now, when it says short-lived, we're still talking about millions of years, okay? But these O stars tend to be big, they're hot, and they kind of like living life in the fast lane. They burn quickly. Um, and release a lot of energy. Um, this is a B B type star, um, and it's a spectrum with helium. It's not ionized. The O stars are ionized. Um, a is another type of bluish star, um, but its temperature is quite a bit cooler. Um, it's a spectrum with no helium, um, but has some calcium, magnesium, and hydrogen. Then we have white stars. Um, only six to 7,500 temperature, yellow stars, 5,000 to 6,000 degrees, uh, cal or 6,000 6, Kelvin. Um, and then we have orange, red, which are, are going to be a bit cooler. Um, certainly with red being the coolest, 2,000 to 3,500 uh, Kelvin. And now remember, uh, you don't want to be living in on a planet that's 3,000 degrees Kelvin. I mean, that's that's definitely a problem. So this chart helps you understand the next diagram, which is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Um, so it's a graph of intrinsic brightness, intrinsic meaning within the star. So uh, intrinsic brightness versus surface temperature.
temperature for the stars. So intrinsic brightness versus surface tensure, temperature. Um, so the diagram plots the relationship between temperature and magnitude of that brightness. Each dot is a star. During their lifetimes, a star will be found in different places on the HR diagram as it undergoes changes. This purple band in the middle, this is the main sequence stars. Um, so these stars use their fuel at a steady state. Those on the upper left of the main sequence are the brightest, bluest, and most massive. Uh, and then we have, and we have red giants. And you can see down here, we have O, B, A, F, G, K, M, and M8. And that relates to this diagram here under type of star. This is degrees to Kelvin up here. And then this is absolute magnitude. The so stars of the red giants are going to be bright, large, and have low energy. Um, and then we have novas and then white dwarfs, which are faint white hearts, hot stars. Uh, and Cepheid variables, which stars that help measure distance. Uh, the HR diagram is to an astronomer what the periodic table is to a chemist. So again, the life of star. A star begins as a nebula, which is a concentration of dust and gas. Over time, nebula fat flattens, heats up, spins, contracts, and traps infrared radiation. The hot center of the nebula becomes a protostar, and the protostar becomes a star when fusion in its core occurs. Where the star is located on the main sequence, so the diagram that we showed above, uh, depends on how massive it is. So it really depends on how massive it is. The more massive main sequence starts to have a higher core temperatures and they use up hydrogen more rapidly, then they end up living millions of years. Less massive stars use their fuel more slowly, more efficiently, and live from billions to trillions of years. This is showing the stages of the sun's life cycle. Uh, it is a funky looking diagram. Um, and here we have hydrogen burning and then eventually helium starts burning here. And then this star might become a red giant. It has gravitational collapse and then becomes a solar mass. So our sun was born about 4.5 billion years ago at position one. So here it will spend most of its lifetime, some 10 billion more years where it will burn hydrogen. So for billions of years that hydrogen fuses to helium, but just realize that no star is going to last forever. So much of the hydrogen starts fusing into helium, the helium helps contract the core due to gravity. The core starts heating up the surrounding shell of hydrogen and fusion. Temperatures start to rise dramatically, and you can see that here. As it does so, um, it becomes more luminous and inflates, creating a red giant. When our Earth reaches the stage in about 5 billion years, it will elevate Earth's temperature and strip its atmosphere. The oceans will be boiled dry. Um, but 
trust me, you won't be around for it, or we will have colonized another planet by then. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to pause here um, and, and finish up in the next video. That's all for now.